So this is an overview of the four lover triangle, which is in itself ridiculous, a triangle of four. Let's go from the beginning and I'm going to be uh, pointing out important lines that you should either write down in a list just to keep yourself occupied or that you could um, underline in the booklet as we go through if you've got it. So we start off with um, lovesick aristocrat, immediately recognisable. He's got trumpets, everything. Uh, he's clearly um, a powerful person. So we, we've established we have this lovesick um, aristocrat and some might think he's feminised here, that he's a feminised man. He is lying around, talking about um, flowers, listening to music, moaning about how in love he is. Um, and the problem is that Olivia isn't going to see any men for the next seven years. Um, but that's not a problem. So if she feels like that, like that about her brother, how will she love um, when it's me? Someone as big as me. When the rich golden shaft of me. So I'm going to draw a rich golden shaft. There it is. It's like the shaft of a spade or a shovel or something. I'll colour it in for you there. So that rich golden shaft is going to go in her and kill all her other, the, all the other affections in her that live in her liver, brain and heart. Um, it's off there. And fill her sweet perfections with oneself same king. So he's going to be her king and fill her with his rich golden shaft. You're right, that's kind of rude, but it's also displays the amount of power he wants to have over her. And she's just not interested. Anyway, we go back to this slightly feminized, uh, slightly, um, maybe feminine, feminine, but a, a certainly a recognizable um, romantic trope, a bit like Romeo, man in love, moping around all over the place, can't think about anything else. Then we move on to find Viola being shipwrecked. And some would say that she is able to take control of the situation immediately. She uh, pays for saying so there's gold. She pays the captain for saying that her brother might be alive. She um, asks questions about the place. She um, comes up with a plan, plan one that she goes and serves Olivia. But that can't happen because Olivia is um, out of action for seven years. Plan two, she enlists the captain's help and goes to serve um, Orsino as a man. So she takes over, she pays for help. She, you might see it in a class way as well, that she's so automatically aristocratic that she plays this these um, lower class servants immediately and, and takes over and sorts herself out. She doesn't sit around crying, let's put it that way. I thank thee, lead me on. So some might say that she's exhibiting these um, masculine traits even before, which I find a bit insulting really, but definitely, uh, even before she's dressed as a man, um, but definitely she's able to rescue herself and sort her own situation out and take command. Then we get to Toby Belch and Maria and we have the joke suitor for Olivia, the joke suitor, to whom Sir Toby says she'll not match above her degree in estate years or wit. You could easily miss that in performance and I've seen it cut out many times. But it's quite an interesting line really that she says she's not going to marry anyone older, wiser or richer than herself. And you might feel that a lot of men do say that. They don't say it out loud. They, they don't, they just do marry richer, poorer women. They just do. Um, without maybe even, you know, if that's just the system that she's bucking. I'm talking about in our time. So that's an important quote to note. Then we have Viola has turned up at Orsino's palace and is clearly already on a, um, a very intimate footing with him. He says to her, I've unclasped to the, the book even of my secret soul. So they've immediately got on on a very profound level. Um, 
And rather than, obviously they're two men, he thinks he's talking to another man, and he sends her to woo Olivia for him. Um, and we have, she's a pretty female male, he's prepared to accept that some men look more female than other men do. Some men can go on RuPaul, some men probably can't go on RuPaul, etc. Have you seen that? So we have lots of jokes that, you know, he, he can see the femininity in this lad. And we have the, she's in love with him, we have the, the triangle. And she's got to go and try and get a woman for him. So then we, we meet Olivia finally, she's in charge of her household, she's got her steward. She um, adjudicates in a kind of match between Malvolio and Feste. She's very able to keep order in her household. And in comes the messenger. And the fact is that he's in standing water between boy and man, and he looks like his mother's milk was scarce out of him. And she says, tick, let him approach that has attracted her. So um, we've got a lot of other notes. I won't say too much about the scenes, the scene between Olivia and Viola. We've got a lot of meta theatre. Um, I've learned my part. I took great pains to study my part. It's poetical. Um, it's ridiculing the romantic poetry and the romantic um, tropes um etc i said etc because i ran out of sentence there so without taking very long viola gets um olivia on her own exit maria in attendance and gets the veil off so lots of humor about about the ridiculous romantic poetry she keeps trying to do but also she does manage to get straight into olivia get her on her own get a veil off the uh, conversation continues. Um, first of all, she tries traditional romantic poetry, but Olivia ridicules it, bats it back. Then she tries um, how much Orsino loves, um, how much Orsino loves Olivia. And Olivia bats that back with honesty. I've written honesty there, look, honesty. I cannot love him. It's quite simple. It's not poetic in that way. Um, he might have took his answer long ago. He's a very gracious person. So straightforwardness, that's it. So the romantic poetry is kind of crushed under that um, honesty there. So attempt three by Viola. If I did love you, I would make myself less than you. I'd make me a willow cabin at your gate and call upon my soul within the house. So I'd make myself less than you if I loved you. And that really, I mean, she was already interested, but this really piques, um, I think it's P-I-Q-U-E-S, piques Olivia's interest. And she asks personal questions. Um, and then they both pull back from that brink and Olivia, and, and come back into, into, into traditional territory. I can't love him, let him send no more. Um, although she does arrange for Viola to come back. Viola ends in a traditional way, farewell, fair cruelty, everything's back. We've been into um, um, a sort of same sex attraction and we've come back out and we're back into normal land. Okay, yes, farewell, fair cruelty. So she ends with that cliche and Olivia realises that she's fallen in love and sends a ring back. We then get the fourth side of the triangle. I love saying that, that Sebastian is alive there. That's all you need to know about that. And it's the placing of that. Sebastian's alive. Um, but uh, and here Viola realises that Olivia's in love with her, but she says, how will this work out? That great word fadge that should be brought back. How will this fadge that should be brought back? We know how it's going to work out. We know Sebastian's on his way to Orsino's and that somehow that'll work it out. So here, the whole triangle is set up. 
with all sorts of different genders and four people in it and women in love with women and men in love with men and the whole thing is um, you could say a satire on romantic comedy or, or romance or you could say a hilariously complicated plot. So the Malvolio story pops up, pops up more on Malvolio story and here is Vi uh, Viola goes back to Orsino to report what happened. She doesn't say, I think, I don't, she doesn't say minus O there, I could do maths, couldn't I? She doesn't say Elizabeth, uh, Olivia fell for me as the messenger. So they talk, they talk about the music. Um, Viola says that she's in love with someone of your complexion about your years um, to Orsino. And Orsino says, um, as you're a man, make sure you've got a younger woman. Ironically, Olivia also wants a younger woman. Um, I've, I've cut the song out. First, it turns up with the song that ridicules Orsino's pose, like um, I want a black coffin and nobody can come anywhere near it. I can't remember anything else about it. No. Let me in a sad Cypress be lane. Uh, no friends at my funeral. And then he calls Orsino changeable and his mind is opal. Um, so we've had Orsino's pose ridiculed again. And he is then on his, he makes himself on his own with Cesario and they have quite an intimate conversation. So he sends Cesario back to Olivia. And Viola says, what if she can't love you? Really, she's in love with me. What if she can't love you? And we might find feel a bit me too about this. I cannot so be answered. I cannot be so answered. I can't take no for an answer. Now, a lot of people might have a lot to say about that. Um, and we would like people to take no for an answer if we mean it, wouldn't we? As part of romance, you might expect to ask, a man might expect to ask a couple of times, be rejected a few times. Otherwise, it seems like the woman is desperate to have sex, get married and have sex. It seems immodest of the woman not to reject him a few times. People who know Mr. Collins in Pride and Prejudice, it's the same idea. So do we forgive it because it's part of the genre? Do we feel a bit uncomfortable with it? Up to you. Um, so, um, Viola's not having it though. You know, surely if there's a woman who feels like you do, must she not then be answered? And Orsino is asserting his masculinity here. He's much better than women are at being in love. There's no women's side. Um, can bear their heart beating like my sides can. No woman's heart so big. I'm gonna have to do it with my finger, I can't do it with the mouse. They lack retention. So I'm a kind of bigger lover than any woman. I may be doing this in love thing that women do, but I'm doing it better. Uh, make no compare between that love a woman can bear me and that I owe Olivia. And he's talking to someone who loves him and he's completely blind to it. Then Viola nearly, um, nearly gives herself away. She says that her sister was madly in love, but she never told, she pined. Um, she was really silent and kept it in, whereas Orsino has definitely not kept it in. Um, and said, he says, did your sister die? I am all the daughters of my father's house. She's about to say, I'm, you know, I'm the daughter and I'm all the brothers too. She kind of pulls back from it. Nice bit of comedy there. And then they, let's put everything back to normal. I'll go to the lady. Yes, give her this jewel. Off you go. In the production, the Globe production from 20, is it 14 with Tim Carroll? They're nearly kissing here. And then they like leap apart. Oh, we can't do that. Two men at that point. So she's been sent back. Meanwhile, everyone loves the Malvolio plot and Malvolio falling for the letter. And Viola goes back to Olivia. Here she is. And she has the big conversation with Feste who has kind of worked out who she is. Give me a line that's kind of worked out who she is. Oh, I know one. Uh, Sandy a beard, kind of joking. There's one of them. And uh, she goes back into Olivia. 
who does um, tell her how she feels. So I, I would you undertake another suit, not for your master, but for you. Um, so, so let me hear you speak. So Olivia's declared herself. I pity you, Viola says, because you're in love with a man who doesn't exist. So, um, but Olivia can't let her go. So she's about to, uh, he, she's about to leave, Cesario's about to leave and Olivia, stay, tell me what you think of me. Lots of meta theatre there that we need to come back to. And um, she's about to go again. Um, no woman's ever going to get me. We know it's because you are a woman. And Olivia's, yeah, come again. She still can't take no for an answer. So she's um, in a lot of ways. Olivia to Cesario is like Orsino to Olivia. She can't let go. She's demanding. She's begging. She's humiliating herself. Um, I wonder if people feel that is more pitiful from a woman to 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 do this chasing than it is from a man. And do those social attitudes still exist? I think they do. Anyway, um, that's an interesting one. So that's her chasing this messenger. So someone not as powerful as her and who's not going to dominate her and another woman, just in case you want to go down the, the lesbian route. So she starts, oh, I've sent after him. I hope he'll come. She's dreaming about Cesario and in comes Malvolio thinking he's in with a chance. And we know what happens there. And so Toby gets called in and he's going to be put in the jail or in a dark room anyway. So meanwhile, so Toby gets Sir Andrew to, he can see how well Cesario is doing with Olivia. So he gets, it's my favourite scene, I think he gets Sir Andrew to fight with Cesario. Meanwhile, no, not meanwhile, next, Sebastian turns up at Olivia's and uh, she pops out and um, proposes to him. I would, you would be ruled by me. And he agrees because it's a comedy and you can in a comedy. Interesting turn of phrase, though, isn't it? Not will you marry me? Can I serve you? Can I be your loving wife? Any of that stuff? I want, would you be ruled by me? And he says he will. So then we have more baiting of Malvolio. We're back to that plot. Finally, Orsino turns up for himself. And Olivia, time to get this job done. And he comes in spouting poet, uh, traditional uh, love poetry. Here comes the Countess, now heaven walks on earth, traditional line. Um, and we have some arguing, he threatens to kill, um, he threatens to kill Cesario, he's going to kill what I love. I'll sacrifice the lamb that I do love. It's like he doesn't realise his own thoughts. But then again, he couldn't, as far as he knows, Cesario's a, man, Cesario's a man, so he couldn't really have him anyway. But Cesario joins in with this ridiculously exaggerated line. Um, in comes Sebastian and everyone understands what all the difficulties have been and why Olivia thinks she's married to Cesario. Here then, this great line at the same time, then so Sebastian says, you are betrothed both to a maid and a man. Spark notes, you're to avert to a man who's a virgin. Georgina Clyde and lots of other readers, I am male and female at the same time. I look exactly like a woman, in a way, a woman who's dressed as me. Um, you know, there are feminine sides to me and masculine sides to me. I like that. Be not amazed, says Orsino to Olivia. Don't worry, he's not a, a nobleman. He's not a nobody. He's not a messenger or anything. He's right noble. I know you want a nobleman to rule over you and be your king. And he is one, Orsino says. So you can have Olivia feeling very disheartened that she's got what, the exact thing she didn't want, if you want, as the director. And then him proposing to Viola as boy. And we end the play uh, with Malvolio. 
and then a bit of fest facing in a song. So that is an overview of the play. Let me there. Um, so I do recommend reading um, Courtly Love, Mocking Courtly Love and Desire that somebody, some one person at the AQA wrote. And um, let's have a look at this. I think I got students to do this. Only because I can tell it's in the wrong tense sometimes. So sometimes you might say the gender boundaries in this play are rigid. Orsino thinks he's very different to women. There's no woman's side as strong as mine. Um, no, their hearts are, my heart's bigger. I forgot what else he said now. Or see, Olivia was nearly contracted to a maid, engaged to a maid, and Orsino felt affection for Cesario, but conforming to a traditional happy ending prevents, that should be an S, prevents these characters from having relationships. So gender boundaries are upheld. It's the happy ending which makes everyone in, um, in a heterosexual relationship at the end, it just has to be to have the marriages. So you might say it's quite rigid in the end because of the happy ending requirements. So examples of masculine women, Olivia is masculine, wants to completely control her relationship. Olivia is Torvald and maintain higher intelligence, wealth and to exceed her in years. Cesario is a woman disguised as a man, but even before the disguise, she was practical and makes plans confidently, enlisting the help of the captain. Then some of the men are quite feminized themselves. Sir Andrew is no he-man. Sir Andrew can't fight to save his life. Um, Cesario, when she's a man, she looks pretty female, but still passes as a man. Um, Orsino, you might think he's quite feminized with his love sickness. Um, and I don't know if I want to say this, no, I can't bother. Anyway, that's just some examples of how fluid the gender lines are in the play. The women taking on manly roles and the men being quite feminized, some might say. Let's go to the interesting ideas of some of the critics, which I have here. There, gender and sexuality, a romantic comedy plot. So, on one side, let me get a good one. I like this one, Porter Williams, 1961. The mistakes the characters make, so Olivia's mistake in falling for Cesario, reveals subconscious patterns of human behaviour. Subconsciously, um, is she a lesbian? And th that mistake reveals her subconscious. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, so in 1938, um, the, N of a, the play is largely concerned with disclosure of unbalanced feelings. There is the enervating, annoying sentimentality of Orsino and the unrestrained emotionalism of Olivia. But you could say Olivia shows no unrestrained emotionalism. The seven years grieving is a ploy or a generic stance, something you expect in the genre. And she's so desperate to get Cesario because she doesn't want to lose her house and her power. That's what makes her desperate, the desire to stay in control, you could say. Or you could say what H.P. Charlton said in 1938. Um, oh, C.L. Barber, 1959. Note the aristocratic, free and easy way Viola settles what she'll do and what the captain will do to help her. Her sprightly language conveys the fun she's having in playing a man's part. A sort of festive pleasure in transvestism is expressed. Yeah, I think that says a lot about C.L. Barber. Uh, I'm just looking for other interesting one. C.L. Barber thought the most fundamental distinction the play brings home to us is the difference between men and women. And Clyde in 2017 thought it was a similarity rather than the difference. Orsino's speeches on male love fem versus female love are ridiculous and neither he nor Olivia notice Cesario's gender and there's lots of fluid boundaries between masculinity and femininity in the play. 
So I think I might think ex the, exactly the opposite of CL Barber. Um, that's one I've already said to you. The Sebastian scene ju comes just before Viola discovers Olivia's fallen in love with her. So we know that it's all going to end well. Here's a lovely one from um, Bertrand Evans. Orsino is a brutally ludicrous representation of romantic masculinity. Um, it, it'd be great if you can remember that line because it's a lovely line, isn't it? Um, but if you can't, you can just say that he satirises romantic masculinity with his golden shaft and wanting to be king. Um, 